Good morning, everybody. They're all asleep. That's 11.30. It's almost lunchtime, right? At least I didn't catch you after lunch because then you would be asleep. So that's good. All right. Um, my name is Todd Warner. I'm one of the two product managers on uh, Red Hat Satellite. The other one is David Kaplan over here. My name is Brian Carney. I'm an engineering manager uh, on the satellite team. And I'm Rich Dorito. I'm the technical marketing manager for satellite. So I'm, I just, uh, by a little show of hands here, I want to see how many of you all, uh, this is the first time you've been to Summit. That's great. And uh, how, many of you were he how many of you were here for the transition talk uh, yesterday? OK, so I have you trained. <laughs> Show the person next to you what you, they're supposed to do. Um, and then uh, also, how many are Satellite 5 only? Satellite 5 only so far. OK. How many uh, Satellite 6 only? Good. And then how many are kind of on that fence right now? OK, good. Nice little selection of folks. Well, what we're going to do here today is we're going to be uh, presenting uh, where we're going with the product. Uh, of course, a little bit about where we are. And, uh, and there will be a good, good amount about uh, where we're headed uh, from a more strategic point of view long term. So um, the, the nuts and bolts of kind of like the schedule in the near term and then uh, and kind of like the grand plans down the road. I'll, I'll, I'll do some teasers surrounding that and, uh, and I'd love your feedback about that. In the middle of this, um, we're going to have a demo with these guys. Live demo, right? Yep, best kind. The best kind. And, uh, it's still being built right now. How many of you have done the, the Satellite 6.2 lab? OK. That's it. OK, so uh, this is not in the uh, newspaper or flyer that we handed out today. But at 1.30 this afternoon in room 3014, we will be running the Satellite 6.2 lab a third time. So if you or your friend or coworker has not uh, registered for that lab and would like to do so, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, you can go ahead and register on the Summit website. You cannot register via the app. So that'll be running at 1.30 this afternoon in room 3014. Uh, other announcements we have is we have our UX team will be here doing interviews. So if you are a Satellite 6 user and you want to give us some feedback about our UXD, please see us on the second floor in the UXD area. And lastly, at 4.45 this afternoon, we have a Satellite Birds of a Feather session in Alcove 2D, I believe. That is in the, uh, the newspaper, if you have it. Uh, myself, Brian, and Mike McKeon will be leading that. Uh, and that's really going to be an open discussion forum for basically anything and everything satellite related that you may not have asked throughout Summit. Uh, so if you want to do that, come see us around 445. With that, my announcements are done. And back to you, Todd. All right, great. So um, one question I forgot to ask is, uh, uh, how many of you are just evaluating satellite right now, and you, you're just learning about it really for the first time during this summit. OK, great. So we have a pretty knowledgeable audience, but some new folks that aren't, aren't so familiar with it. That's great. Hopefully, I can, uh, this will be quick, because we have a demo right in the middle, and we, we want to make sure we allow a lot of time for Q&A. I like to allow a big chunk of time for that. So one thing about satellite, satellite's a 14-year-old project now. And, uh, and it's evolved uh, quite a bit over, that, over the, the, that time period. So satellite today is, um, is really about production operations, and it's something very familiar. If you're a Satellite 5 user, Satellite 6 will be very familiar to you at the, at, the, um, uh, at the model and architecture level. There's a lot of changes, though. But any, ultimately, in the end, our product is designed for you to define systems, deploy those systems, and then manage, manage them over time. It's, the intent is to bring discipline to your production operations. And through that, uh, some of you have seen this uh, target uh, graphic before. We do, there's a lot of operations surrounding uh, life cycle that you're all familiar with. So provisioning systems, configuration, configuration of systems, uh, as well as managing all the content that ends up uh, uh, on those systems, and, and then, of course, uh, managing subscriptions and your ability to understand your, your, uh, uh, the inventory, the assets that, you're, that are under management. So 
if you're familiar with Satellite 5, a lot of these concepts are similar, but Satellite 6 expands upon uh, the, those models that you're familiar with. So with Satellite 5, you could do uh, pixie booting, and, and you could do some uh, from boot ISO uh, 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 discovery-ish type things. Well, Satellite 6 definitely takes that to the next level with uh, allowing you to do um, bare metal discovery as well as uh, plug it into pixie systems and whatnot for provisioning. Now we're getting to the point where we're well beyond RPMs as the, as the solitary beans of delivering stuff. It used to be RPMs and then uh, a binary blob or something you flung on machines or text files. So we're trying to blend uh, the uh, concept of RPMs, puppet modules, containers, everything. They're, they're all content that you're driving through to your end systems, and satellite is there to help you manage all those things. And then ultimately, if you want to configure uh, those end systems, we have the puppet built in. And, and we'll talk about uh, where that might be changing over time. So the, t the architecture uh, for Satellite 6 is very much like Satellite 5, except it, uh, kind of a, um, much more, uh, uh, there's much more detail to it. than Satellite 5 was really satellite and uh, these uh, pseudo-dumb proxies that, that do federation. Satellite 6 is much more federated. The, ca the uh, capsules, which are the an an anagram to uh, proxies, are much smarter. We also now are feeding in things like uh, Red Hat Access Insights. Um, and then, of course, we're, and I'll talk a little bit about later how we're blending in all the other management products uh, um, so that we're operating as a, a management suite of products with uh, Tower, Cloud Forms, um, uh, Insights, and more. So architecture, very much uh, sat one satellite, multiple satellites, federate with capsules, and, uh, and you have your operators, you have different teams with different roles and responsibility that operate on the satellite. You can manage your, your systems and, your, and the, the definition of those systems through a uh, life cycle path of te dev test and production. Now those capsules are different than those proxies, if you're familiar with Satellite 5, and that those capsules that federation device are much smarter. They both uh, work as a, a, a pass-through gatewaying device, but also they actually perform operations and distribute operations out throughout your network. So if, um, uh, uh, Satellite 6 is really positioning to be, to help you scale very large, uh, both in depth and breadth of, of your infrastructure. So just a quickie about the, our past two releases. So Satellite 6.0 really was our, we, we revamped the whole platform that uh, we, from the original satellite to the new satellite. And it was really a more modern Satellite 5 positioned for the future. 6.1 was really focused on closing all those missing gaps uh, to satisfy all, the, all you good Satellite 5 customers. It also focusing on scale and uh, a lot of polish, like UI and workflow and things like that. And then, uh, and then we brought in things like metal, metal as a service, uh, bare metal uh, discovery and, and provisioning. We also integrated OpenSCAP. How many of you using OpenSCAP? Excellent. Part of our demo will show you a little bit of that, and I hope it interests more of you because OpenSCAP is great. Um, we also... Uh, uh, how many of you here are operating satellite in disconnected environment? Oh, very good. So disconnected, you, you don't even have to talk to Red Hat directly uh, to keep uh, manage your systems. Um, and then also, uh, how many of you have more than a few satellites? Yeah, same guys that were disconnected. <laughs> <laughs> There's a pattern. So, um, we have customers that have two satellites. We have customers that have 150 satellites um, deployed. And uh, and the uh, and, and, and often they are interacting with each other, synchronizing between. All right, so we have Satellite 6.2 coming. There's a beta right now. Get involved if, if you get a chance. 6.2 is coming right down the road. End of roughly uh, uh, late July is what we're saying. Lots of improvements there and then closing a couple key gaps that were missing. For example, remote execution. You, you want to uh, take an arbitrary script, you want an arbitrary command or a canned uh, operation, job scheduling, um, uh, remote execution against all your 10,000 machines or how many you have. 
and it has a lovely UI, and you are touching on that. We will show it. That we've shown in demo as well. Inter-satellite sync, if you have multiple satellites, we're improving that process um, to make it as clean, as seamless as possible. And over time, I'm not going to talk too much in the future, but we're, right now it's all about uh, content view content and, uh, and uh, RPM especially, um, but we are going to uh, build out means to uh, uh, synchronize more, more things. Atomic host, how many of you are playing with containers? Okay. Well, containers are, are, are a huge part of Red Hat's future, and satellite is a part of that future. So um, right now, with Satellite 6.2, you'll be able to flow your content uh, through, uh, through the satellite to OpenShift or, or your DevOps operational uh, teams um, uh, outside of the satellite and then feed that stuff back in. Uh, we could talk a little bit about, I'm going to talk a little bit about where we're going with that in the future. Um, you can now support multiple versions of content views in one environment. I know this is a, a, a key request from a lot of our customers. So those who are not familiar with uh, uh, content views, content views is literally um, a repository with filters on top of it and you version it, right? And then we have the concept of a library development test production. And you can have multiple paths and all that stuff where you actually publish and promote. And so you can control the, the what your systems are seeing. Very much like channel cloning, but much more refined. And, um, and now you can have in one environment, say your dev environment, you can have multiple versions of content view and assign a system to those different versions. Capsule uh, observability is much improved. You can see what a capsule's up, down, what's going on with it. And our documentation is greatly enhanced um, uh, with 6.2. And now I have slides that just said everything I just said. All right. So now we're going to dive into the demo, and then we'll come back for a few, uh, more future-focused uh, discussion. Okay. So Rich and I are going to walk you through the demo real quick. We're utilizing the same... Uh, images that the lab is using. So if you were in the lab earlier, you've seen a lot of this before. Uh, if you haven't and you're interested in the lab, we're going to kind of give you a, a tease for what's going on so you get a chance to see that. I'll be driving and Rich will be keeping me honest as we move forward. So the first thing we want to talk about is uh, the discovery uh, feature that came out. It actually came out as part of uh, ZStream on 6.1. Uh, Discovery has been part of Satellite 6 from the, uh, since 6.1, but one of the features that we heard very strongly from people is about half of our customers love Pixie and thinks it's, it's the greatest thing in their environment. The other half think it's the largest uh, security hole they have in their environment. So the initial version of Discovery required Pixie. The version that came out later um, no longer requires it. It's a feature that allows you to generate a single ISO that somebody can walk around to their machines. When they boot up the machines, it's a full-fledged RHEL 7 instance that will then register that newly racked machine back to the satellite so now that it's in inventory. That's nice. You have it in inventory. You can provision it. But one of the things that becomes interesting that you might want to do is to create some rules so that instead of bringing it into a generic inventory, you start to do something interesting and be begin an initial provisioning of that machine based on what comes in. So we'll walk you through that. You go to the discovery rules page. We'll give it a name for the rule. We'll call it something silly like summit rule. Hey, all complete. And then you can do a set of search criteria about how, what uh, rules do I want to apply to the machines when they're discovered based on the facts that have been generated about that machine in order to bucket them correctly. So we'll do a simple one here. We'll say, OK, based on the facts that come in, I want to use the architecture fact. And I'm going to say, you know what, for all x86-64 machines, this rule is going to apply. I want to apply the RHEL 7 uh, standard operating environment host group. You can do different priorities so that you can say this one applies first. If it doesn't match, applies the second one later. And then you can say which particular locations these apply into. You can have multiple of these uh, machines. Yeah, look at that. You have multiple of these rules that you want. And again, the priority does what order to do them in. So now let's go ahead and simulate uh, actually setting up and installing or uh, racking a machine. We're doing everything on libvirt here just because it's easier to do on a laptop. So we'll go ahead and bring that over here. Why oh, does it like that? We sudo. Did, did you get the I ISO? No, it should be there. Okay. Yeah, you might I didn't do it in sudo. Control A. All right, I'm a manager. I don't know how to do that. Yeah, did you get the ISO? 
All right, we didn't get the ISO. All right, if you had seen that, it would have come up, and it would have either, and it would have initially gone into the discovered hosts. Once those rules had been applied, it would then go into the all host collection, and you would have seen it come up there, okay? You'll have to come down to the booth or to the lab later to see that actually work. We promise it does work. Um, a second way that you can bring a, uh, a machine into the environment other than provisioning a new machine is you might have it provisioned it outside of satellite. Uh, satellite 5 has a bootstrap script that will do all the heavy lifting for you to bring that machine under the control of satellite into its inventory. Satellite 6.2 is introducing the exact same script like that. So I'll show you what I'm going to be doing here. And you see it's a very simple uh, set of command lines. I'm telling it what server to go to. I'm giving it some credentials. I'm at saying what organization to go into, what location, et cetera. Um, Rich, up here with me, is actually the author of that script, and I'll let him talk about cool. uh, what's going on there. So the bootstrap script is it's primarily designed for any system that's not registered to Satellite 6. So regardless of what platform it's registered to, that could be Red Hat Satellite 5, that could be Red Hat Classic, Red Hat Network Classic, that can be RHSM, or it could just be a random rel system you found sitting in the corner that someone built but didn't register to satellite. Uh, how do you get those systems registered in? Bootstrap PY gives you uh, the ability to do that. It has a number of functions, and uh, I think it's like 25 or so uh, switches we have, have in it already to basically give you all the flexibility that you want. So if you wanted to you know, just bring the system in, just bring it under management, make no further changes, you can do that. If you want to bring it in, fully update it, remove all the old RHM packages, you can do that. If you're running uh, maybe like a non-Red Hat provided puppet, such as like Puppet Enterprise or something, we have a switch there that says, hey, don't worry about the puppet stuff. I take care of that elsewhere. It has a number of options there. Obviously, as uh, we determine more things that you need to uh, add into the bootstrapping process, we'll obviously add those into the script as well. Okay. So if we now come back, I went to the host, all host list. You see that RHEL 7 has now been brought into inventory. It's been tied to a particular environment. It has its host group, et cetera. You see that it's still, uh, we don't have the exact errata information because it's still going through the uh, installation, the registration process behind it, but it's going through all the steps that Rich mentioned to bring it under inventory. Once this is done, it's fully being controlled by the satellite. Todd earlier talked about uh, Vagrant SSH, OSCAP client. Todd earlier today talked about uh, Open SCAP. Oh, you're not in the control deploy directory. Control C. Where am I at? Where do I? How do I get to that? Okay. Control deploy. This is the part where we start, you know, tap dancing well. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So we talked about open SCAP earlier. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna simulate what would be going on as the agents inside the machine. So we're gonna simulate a puppet run so that you, uh, uh, will, which will be running on an everyday, that would be running every day on that machine, pseudo puppet agent dash T. What this is gonna do is this is gonna uh, reach out to the satellite, it's gonna bring down all the configurations for the open SCAP client and set up, set up this, bu this box to run. And I wanna watch cat what? Let's see, open SCAP, what was it? Get form in SCAP client. So what you'll see in this configuration file is uh, it's the mapping of the open SCAP policy that you've associated for this client. So for those of you who've used uh, open SCAP in Satellite 5, one of the big things that we allowed you to do is we allowed you to run the SCAP scans, but we left the distribution of the content as an exercise for you to figure out. In Satellite 6, you don't have to worry about distributing the content, we actually do that as part of the process of uh, setting up Open SCAP. So what happens is the client has two configurations. It has a local configuration of where is it going to store the, the uh, XML content once it's downloaded it, and it also has a URL of where to get that content if it's not present. So if you update that content on the satellite side, you don't have to worry about going through a alternate out-of-band process to redistribute SCAP content. The next time the client runs the policy, it'll check to see if it has the latest and pull it down from satellite if necessary. So while Rich was talking, I simulated uh, the SCAP client running. And let's go ahead and see what it did. I'll go back over to the satellite. I'll bring up the report, and we see that now a compliance report has occurred less than one minute ago. We provide you two sets of reports in Satellite 6. One is targeted for managers. If you notice, it has a lot of colors. There's a lot of red, a lot of green. <laughs> and we have charts. Excellent for showing to managers. The more green, the happier they're going to be. 
You have a different audience around SCAP. You have a set of auditors that want to make sure that the machines are up to date. Um, the Open SCAP tools are uh, certified by NIST. I think it's SCAP uh, 2014 is a standard that I get. And we give you the actual report that comes out of that tool in the exact format that comes from that tool. That way, the satellite that you're running inherits the exact same uh, 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 compliance and the exact same certification that the tooling gets. So by using satellite, you can say that you're using a uh, NIST certified tool for scanning your environment, which can be very useful when communicating with, uh, with your auditors. So let's take a look then at what this uh, report comes out. I'm gonna go ahead and search on one of the failures that I know is there, password minimum age. And one of the things that's interesting about these reports is that it will give you an amount of remediation that comes out of it. So here is uh, the minimum age has failed, and here's how they suggest that you actually remediate the minimum age. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy that. And we're gonna move away from Open SCAP for a little bit. I'm gonna go over to, where am I going? Job templates. And I'm gonna go over to remote execution. And I'm gonna create a job that's gonna go out and to remediate that failure that we just saw. So I'm gonna create a new job template I'm going to call it password minimum age. You saw that Rich and I were testing this earlier. I'm going to paste in what I just had, and then I'm going to simulate the agent running again so that I know and once I've remediated it, please kick off that uh, foreman SCAP client one. Please kick off that run again. We'll come back and talk to you a little bit about this in a second. I'm going to go hit submit. I have a new job. So now I'm going to go back over to the reports. I'm going to find that machine that failed. And let's go ahead and run that job that we just created. Want to talk a little about remote execution? Yep. So while Brian's running that job, you can see that we selected the job template. One of the options we have, a very powerful option, is called bookmarks. So bookmarks are basically dynamically generated uh, collections of systems that you can run th things against. So just how we can search for systems based upon like facts, such as their architecture or their name or what lifecycle environment they're in, you can use this as a dynamic grouping mechanism to run a remote execution job. I'm talking about scheduling? Yeah, just go ahead and submit. Okay. So with regards to uh, scheduling, we're going to execute that job immediately, obviously, because we want to show you this live. But you also have the capability of running that job at a uh, future time uh, against those systems in question or you have the ability to uh, set up a recurring execution. So let's say, for instance, uh, you wanted to make sure that a particular service or application got restarted, uh, you know, second Friday of the month on a recurring basis. You have the ability to uh, take that and uh, set up a remote execution job so that it runs. So as you can see here, uh, the job's just finished. We show it as being succeeded. If you're running against multiple hosts, the color of that chart will change you know, kind of proportionately to the number of systems that have failed or passed. Did you have a question? Yeah, just a quick question. Right now, I'm going to scan the standalone server. I have a working setup. Do you have an option to do on remediation where it goes to the system and does the change? Now, I mean, this change like this is okay, but it seems like it's more work required as opposed to just like on remediation. Is that in the roadmap? Um, it is in the roadmap. I have heard mixed things about the immediate remediation. I've heard people say it's the greatest thing ever, and I've also heard people say it can be very, you want to review it before you apply it. Uh, so, but you will see those type of features coming out on the roadmap going forward, so. Okay, if we go back then and take a look at the reports that just come up. We have a second report that came up, and if we search on the password minimum age, I'll stay in the manager dashboard for right now. You see that now password minimum age is passed. So again, you've seen how SCAP can be used. It can detect an issue. You, know, you saw how remote execution can be used to reach out to that machine, remediate it exactly, and to affect some sort of a change. We can provide you some more information uh, downstairs um, on remote execution if you'd like to see more about it. One of the things that uh, um, Rich touched on a little bit and people have asked about is how robust can the scripts be? We're using ERB under the cover, so the scripts can be as robust or not as you want them to be. And you can set up uh, different parameters, et cetera, so parameters are required, parameters that are optional, et cetera, so users, when they're making use of the jobs, uh, they can be as robust as possible, and the scripting can then do uh, branching logic, et cetera, based on what they pass out, what, they, uh, what it's passed in. 
if you'd like another tour of that, come down to the booth later on uh, and we can show you about that. I'll show you more information about that. Other things that Todd talked about, we're coming to the end real quick. Uh, we have a lot, more fun a lot more work has been done on capsule visibility. So if I went over the infrastructure screen, I can see the capsules that are on this laptop right now. You have a lot more detail to understand what's going on in the topology of your satellite infrastructure. I see here that uh, the amount of storage that's been used, I've only used about three gigs of the 95 gigs that are there, so you can have a better idea of what's going on in your environment. I can see the state of the services that are going on, so I can see the various services that are deployed on this capsule, and if we have some heartbeat on it, we can actually bring that back and let you know if they're up or not. Back on the overview page, I can also begin to understand what machines within my environment are being managed by that particular uh, capsule, so I can click on that and I can see that, okay, these are the machines that are being managed by this capsule, other ones are being managed by a different capsule. And as Rich mentioned earlier, this is all done doing searching, so you can create bookmarks on this, et cetera, as you want going forward. The last thing we want to talk about was around uh, content, the new content type. Todd mentioned this earlier. Uh, with Satellite 6.1, you had access to RPMs, kickstarts, uh, puppet modules, et cetera. We begin now in 6.2 to introduce OS Tree or Red Hat Atomic. Where this has become really useful for you if you're, is if you're playing with OpenShift and you're beginning to use OpenShift within your, within your environment, Satellite can manage the OpenShift infrastructure. You can uh, sync down and you can manage uh, Rel Atomic in the same way that you'd manage any other Red Hat operating systems. You can move them through a deployment lifecycle. And then once you've deployed and provisioned it, uh, Red Hat OpenShift can come along and install on top of it. And now Satellite's managing the OpenShift environment. Anything else? Um, no, that's okay. it. Back to Thought you. Thought yours. Take me back to the. From here? Cool. Oh, I'm going to start you over, sorry. Oh, my goodness. Let me get you back to the. You can do it, Todd. Whoa. Now, now you have to, this is where you tap dance again. <sighs> Product managers fail. I never remember this. Uh, yeah, there we go. Well, great, guys. Um, yeah, par part of this discussion is we can't go into every single iota of change that we're doing but I want to give you a sense of what we're doing and where we're going. And, uh, and so now let's look towards the future. Um, if you're familiar with Spacewalk, which is the upstream for Satellite 5, like I said before, Satellite 6 is an entirely new code base. And um, uh, the core project that is associated to that is the Foreman. Um, and the, it's a very robust community. I suggest you check it out if, uh, if uh, you're definitely more community focused. Um, and, but under the covers, there's other projects involved as well. Uh, Catello is really what's managing all that workflow and lifecycle stuff surrounding uh, content views. Candlepin is kind of our su uh, subscription asset management um, uh, um, part. Pulp manages all that content being uh, uh, versioned and copied and moved around. And ultimately, Pulp is pretty cool. And, it, and the, 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 the grand dream is to be able to manage uh, any kind of content with kind of versioning, um, both native to like RPM and some such, but also with the, the, the content uh, repositories themselves. And then Puppet, of course, uh, for configuration management. Now, one thing we want to talk about in the future is that with Satellite 6.2, for example, we're introducing uh, much more uh, uh, atomic stuff, so containers, container things. And then, of course, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Puppet and Ansible and where that is. So one thing I want, if you're all been, especially all those folks that have satellites now, our releases have been kind of lengthy. You know, you know, we're looking at, you know, some of them like 18 months between ma uh, major versions. We're bumping up the cadence. So uh, 6, 60, 61, 62, they're really one year releases more or less. 63 and onwards, we're really attempting to hit a date driven model with um, every six months. Uh, you'll, there'll be smaller releases but there will be quicker and uh, um, uh, easier for you guys to, to, to wrap your arms around as far as um, um, both planning, I think, because it will be pr more predictable, and then also uh, a smaller set of changes for you to, to absorb. So uh, the major versions, like you know, 5, 6, 7, 8, um, uh, we, don't know, we don't have a particular cadence yet for that. 
Um, but we're also releasing our Z stream, um, like uh, uh, it would be 6.2.1, 6.2.2. We're going to try to hit uh, one month marks for those um, uh, to, so that you can have a regular cadence of, of updates and something that's predictable for you. All right, so uh, 6.3 is, is, is in planning. It's uh, mostly cemented in place, but uh, I have a little disclaimer at the bottom. All roadmaps are speculative, uh, but th this is pr pretty solid at the moment. One thing we're looking at is we're updating some of our tooling. Puppet 4 will be introduced in 6.3, um, as well as uh, 3.8. Uh, that is the plan. You're ultimately, you're going to have to choose between one or the other, um, but we will be supporting both. Ansible is going to be part of the process of uh, provisioning and configuring, uh, conf configuring machines embedded in the satellite itself. Um, but that's not, uh, if, uh, if you're able to attend any of the Ansible Tower presentations, uh, you know, uh, if you're doing a, a really ad hoc playbook design and deployment and uh, managing um, uh, uh, robust job scheduling and whatnot, and really orchestrating machines and layers on top of the machines that you deploy with your satellite, uh, you want, may, may want to take a look at Tower as well. Uh, plus, they're doing really cool stuff with building containers and whatnot. Uh, finally, uh, we have uh, one thing that pe a complaint has been for our, our products surrounding organizations is we don't have a canned role called organizational admin. We have a workaround if you, if you have trouble finding it, but if you go to the portal and search for it, we have a nice workaround for you to uh, easily set up that role within our, uh, our back model. Uh, but in 6.3, we're going to formalize it and, 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 of course, support it. We're doing lots of things to make the product both easier for you to troubleshoot and at the same time, when you call us, call up support, be able to deliver the, uh, articulate the problems between Red Hat and, and your environment. So we've done, it was 6.2, we've done a bunch of polish where we, uh, you know, we're just clean up performance issues, UI uh, uh, inconsistencies and things like that. And then 6.3, we're just taking that to the next level, improving the supportability of the product, but also the understandability uh, from your side. Lots of, uh, lots of polish. Polish is always high priority. In, uh, for us, um, uh, IPv6. How many people care about IPv6? Oh, too many. <laughs> so I, I, I joke about that. I understand that IPv6 is important to lots of folks, but it's one of those. Pri it's uh, you know, containers takes priority over IPv6. Everything takes priority. So anyway, we're we're going to put a stake in the ground and get IPv6 out the door um, in a timely fashion. We're also doing lots of. Uh, and I have another slide for that, but we're doing a lot of management integrations with all our management products I mentioned b before, and also we're doing um, uh, uh, a better policy engine surrounding uh, multi-node discovery. So management is no longer as simple, as you all know. It, it used to be a bunch of white boxes, and then it became racks, and then it became, you know, it's getting more and more complex, and you have a variety of types of platforms. Um, uh, to, to, to manage, right? Whoa, my slide was not blue. Um, interesting. Okay, so Red Hat as well, IT is going through a transformation, but Red Hat is going through a transformation as well. So you have your application infrastructure, you've got your uh, new ways of developing software. Uh, Red Hat is definitely a big, big developer support uh, company as well. But really, management, we're all focusing on operations right now. And uh, we have uh, a set of products within our group, CloudForms, Ansible Tower, Insights, and Satellite. And as we move forward, we're going to probably expand that base of management, but also going to build uh, uh, coherent integrations. And, um, and, and you'll be seeing reference architectures surrounding all these over time. So I just want to take one, okay, you want to pause for one second? What was your question, sir? Yeah, so I, I so far get in every satellite session or lab session or in a scrum or in a lobby, get password. There is one, and others may disagree, but in my opinion, I think there's one missing piece here. And that's that um, in addition to management, I would, I'd really like to see satellite provide Okay, so if I 
Right. But it may be a more immediate concern if I have a full group audit. So to, just to get the top 10 metrics, the top 20 metrics. Right. So, so and this is kind of outside. We have, so one, uh, we used to have monitoring embedded in satellite five. Um, like monitoring in the big M, you know, and uh, and 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 uh, you know we were heading towards a Nagios level a type of monitoring with that. So what I understand what you're saying is you just want to know the health and state of systems, and we're definitely um, uh, expanding those those uh, that tooling, and we also want to get to a more event um, uh, 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 flow uh, between from the clients all the way to the top. Um, but uh, there is a lot of work to be done there. But it's definitely uh, uh, something that's. Uh, yeah, just expand on that. We have, we have really big enterprise wide monitoring schemes and some other, other metrics. We're engineers. And there's, that whole suite is critical for some things. But I've got thousand VMs that we just need to know. I wonder if there's something more like for insights. Right. So, so uh, and, and this is where you saw that little suite of uh, management products. We were trying to determine, like, does that something that insights? Uh, brings a bear is that where cloud but the, the thing is that that discussion is happening and and um, uh, we're not ignoring the problem is what I'm trying to get to but satellite alone right now today there it can do lots of good things but there are some things that are definitely missing um, as far as that real time uh, what's going on with the system so let me let me go through kind of like a more longer term sampling of some of this integration that we're talking about um, but that's not really right true. now, satellite can do satellite six is delivering container management from a product's perspective in the sense that um, I, I, I dislike this graphic. But anyway, so uh, the the greater internet's on the left, and your systems are on the on the right, and so you got uh, um, a registry that you can absorb into satellite, a container registry. Manage those through life cycles uh, of, of life cycle environments. And then, uh, and then those could be, and all that, con all those containers get mirrored out to the federated ca capsules, uh, to closer to your systems, and then you can you can pull pull that those containers to those hosts, right? So, oh my goodness, somehow everything turned blue. Awesome. My slides are prettier than this. All right, so let me kind of give you an example of where. Uh, how many of you? like really label yourself as production operations, IT operations, where you're, okay, interesting. Okay, and how about development operations? Neither. Okay, so we're all struggling with these terms. Um, so production operations, really the tra traditional uh, uh, governed, um, uh, well, well thought out design as far as uh, managing system definition and content going out the door, release engineering, um, from a very uh, a strict and disciplined process. Well, DevOps is really that, you know, quick, fast uh, development and that churn cycle into uh, testing and, and, and getting, getting both uh, um, uh, the standard operating environments developed as well as applications on top. Well, satellite with containers can really help. For example, if you're running OpenShift, as an example, satellite can manage the underlying infrastructure, which is not represented here, um, of atomic hosts that containers eventually get deployed to, but also we can deliver containers to the, uh, um, uh, uh, the development operational uh, tooling called OpenShift. If anybody, how many of you played with OpenShift? Some of you? Okay. So an OpenShift team, they want to they, they build their gold image. Uh, they might be, they pull down a container from Red Hat, you know, for RHEL 7. Um, uh, baseline, they'll churn on that, and when they're done, they'll publish it to satellite, back into the registry. All right. So there's a lot of churn that happens in the in the DevOps world down below. They publish it to satellite. It, it starts going through the process of uh, of uh, of your lifecycle environments, uh, maybe dev, maybe test, and production, and then they deliver. But th that production is is actually a, a gold image delivered to another team, and that may be the app team, the apps team, who's building on top of it, all right? And then they go through their own churn process, and, they, and the dev team says, oh, we're, our, our app's good, we want to put it to production, and the production operation team will say, yeah, wait, no, you have to go through our process, it has to be vetted, we have to go through a staging process, and, 
and therefore they would publish it back in, works back through the, uh, the, the lifecycle flow, eventually gets to some production operation team, a release engineering team that uh, wants to take those containers and deploy them into the field. Um, this is kind of like a, a really broad brush example of kind of where we're taking some of these managed products so that a, production, a, tr a traditional production operational team can manage that process because in the end, um, if you're a satellite admin, that's, that's usually at the hub of your operations surrounding REL and, uh, and, and, in, and you're a governance facility. But we don't want to block teams that want to iterate rapidly and those teams may not necessarily have user accounts on that satellite. You want them to be able to consume from you and then when they're done, publish to you so that you can deliver it through your internal, internal customers and ultimately to your end production systems. So that's just a sampling of what we're, tr we're trying to do with this suite of products. There's a lot that we could spend all day talking about architectures. Um, but uh, in the world of containers, uh, 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 that, that's, a, that's a route we're taking. So that kind of sums up the generalized roadmap where we're going. Um, six month cycle, we're seeing a lot of good things come down the pipe. Uh, and we definitely want to make sure that you guys are getting uh, uh, releases sooner, sooner than you have been in the past. There is a beta right now. Please jump on the beta um, if you have not already. And uh, towards the late July is when uh, 6.3 is going to be rolling out the door. So. 6.2. 6.2. 6.2. Product managers. <laughs> I want it sooner. Together. Product managers are always op overly optimistic. Yes. <laughs> so 6.2. So we'll spend 6.3 in three days. 6.3. No we're trying to hit that six-month life cycle. All right. So I know you guys got lots of questions. Let's see some hands. Yes. That's it. <laughs> Other questions? Easy questions. Um, here after everyone leaves, or down in the satellite booth? And and the birds of a feather later on today is at four thirty. Yeah. And it's in Enclave 2-something. Yeah, 2C or 2B. It's basic, basic, we will be there to answer any questions. And if there are other customers there, our hope is that we can get you guys talking to each other, answering each other's questions. So come and prepare. We'll ask you questions, too. So be nice here. Yeah. So. Yes, sir. So the, the, question, the, the question was, with regards to reporting, are we planning to add uh, robust levels of reporting into satellite? Currently today, you do a lot of reporting via the API. Okay. Right. So, so, I mean, we, we want to improve reporting, certainly, um, over time. And uh, you know, where that l sits in the, in, the, in the priorities, I can't really state at the moment. But we also want to balance you know, something that's easy to consume that you can automate. Right uh, versus something that's kind of an ad hoc state, like what is my state? So we have a lot of like, what are the state of my systems views? Uh, what are the state of my capsules? A view of that, uh, which is a kind of reporting, but it's not a report. Um, and then ultimately, satellite. Um, are you satellite five? So you're probably used to the canned reports or spacewalk reports. Have you used those? So uh, we definitely want to drive towards being able to have some uh, can easy. Uh, uh, reports that you can spit out, and I think Hammer delivers some of those. We have some, but not at the level of the. Uh, so yeah, we're just we're going to keep adding to that over time. Um, uh, so, so certainly, and then the APIs are very robust and, and, and broad. Yes, sir. What are the future plans for InterSatellite Sync? So InterSatellite Sync right now, um, it was six two. It's a it's a sneaker net, but we cleaned that up, cleaned up that process, and then it also includes uh, um, incrementals. Right, and um, and we're, he's talking about uh, synchronizing multiple satellites, and then uh, and then six three. I I don't know where it is in the prioritization, but we want to get to the point where it's direct satellite satellite. You can do that as well. 
uh, just yep. synchronized between them. But that's on the roadmap for sure. The, uh, the intermediate step, though, right now we're basically exporting content from one satellite to another. So your downstream satellite is looking at some environment, some content view in the upstream satellite. The intermediate step is going to be to export that content view data so that if in the upstream you create content view X version 12, when you import it downstream, you'll see that version X and, and Lex in version 12 downstream. So today's prioritization shows that next and then do that dynamically over the wire. Thing to CDN now. Other questions? CDN. So the answer is yes. So what you're going to see, the stock answer we're giving people is, is that if you're a puppet shop today and you've invested in puppet, uh, your investment is safe, right? You saw Todd up there earlier say that we're delivering Puppet 4 going forward. Ansible is going to become a first-class citizen of satellite. So everywhere today where you see in the GUI, you see Puppet reports, the ability to do Puppet run, you'll see satellite begin to use the Ansible language to do the exact same features. In the same way that we can manage a Puppet Master to provide recurring policy against a machine, You'll see on the roadmap in the 6.3 and 6.4 time frame the ability to do that using Ansible as a language. So you'll see across all of Red Hat's products, Ansible will be the language to describe the data center. But it'll be, an it'll be your choice. You can use Puppet or Ansible or both if it makes sense within your shop. That's right. what we're looking and then at. If, if, if you're asking the larger question about uh, how about Tower, where the, we'll be integrating user interfaces between those major products, that, that is left to right. the design process. We haven't got there right. yet. We don't know how so, much integration there will be so, in, in that regard. This man in white over here keeps raising his hand, and we don't call him. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the, uh, are, are you able to decouple the, uh, the uh, puppet module that you apply to the content or the input that you find in a content view? Yes. Yes, yeah, in 6.1, you have the ability to set the puppet environment distinctly from the content view. So if you have scenarios where your RPM content is on a different life cycle than your puppet content, you can, you can totally model your content views uh, in such a manner to where you can alternate those two things at different life cycles. We'll take Scott's question. Hey, dude, it's like the third day of summon. I'm just now seeing you. I've been trying to find you for two days. Okay. We'll Shoot your question. We'll catch up later. <laughs> You'll begin to see that in 6.3, the ability to coexist with the other Puppet environments. So the biggest issue that we, the biggest issue, honestly, that's holding us back right now is the installer, is that our installer doesn't work with a Puppet 4, so it's, and you use the installer every time that you upgrade. And so you'll see that in the latest version of Kafo upstream has already been fixed. So hopefully in 6.3, you'll, that restriction will go away. Right, and also Puppet Labs no longer uses a distinctly separate agent. Yes, they have, a, they have a wonderful tarball over in slash opt that that helps a little bit too. Yes, sir. In that specific version, if you go and look upstream right now, you'll see that upstream Foreman uh, has support in 1.12 for Puppet 4. Uh, so we're on the latest versions of Puppet up there. I don't know the exact version offhand. So we're seeing a better integration between 3 and 4 upstream. Um, so we're probably, it's probably going to be very similar today. The, you know, the most recent on those two streams is what we'll be comfortable with. And then the rest will be an exercise in, well, we've tested it here. How different is it? And it should be OK. Else? 
you're not going to, you won't be creating playbooks in the satellite right. UI in the same way that you don't go to satellite and create puppet modules or you don't go to satellite and create RPMs. So, you know, the benefit around about Ansible as a language is it's very easy to understand, very easy to create. We will be treating uh, playbooks in the same way that we treat puppet modules. It'll be content that will come into the satellite, it'll be pushed out to the environment and then used. Uh, you'll be assigning roles, et cetera, to the machines that are applied on an ongoing basis. Um, so we really won't have an impact. You know, Ansible is easy to learn. You'll be doing that outside of the tool. So the remote execution stuff um, today that you need, I think, it is, right? Yes. Are there plans to support obviously Ansible moving forward to that to that area and what blocks you provide? Um, Ansible not in the immediate short term. Um, that's potentially a long term. Um, M Collective, that's not on our roadmap right now. You know, what, um, you know, this seems to fit the need of, of what we have right now uh, within the satellite community. It appears that uh, Puppet is moving, uh, uh, they're enhancing M Collective, and we're not sure how much we're going to be able to bring that in and package it through satellites. So we don't want to bank on that within our environment. Uh, so. Additionally, so, so really the remote execution is in support of the, 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 the traditional satellite processes, and you, can, you have a pretty expansive uh, um, a nuance that you can use that remote execution for. But if you start doing lots of orchestration type activities and whatnot, we really do suggest uh, Ansible Tower for that, that type of thing. Um, uh, because that's, the, that's what it's all about. They are a plug into Fair and Foreman and project. Foreman remote project. execution? Is that what it is, Ohad? Foreman yep. remote execution. So the, qu the question was where in, where in upstream is the, the uh, remote execution bits, and it's in Foreman. Yeah. Way in the back corner. Did you hear him? Yeah. Yes, OAuth report for hammer scripting. OAuth support. Actually, I opened up Oak. <laughs> we, we have a larger endeavor within the company to kind of clean up the, the way we're doing single sign-on. I don't know where that stands at the moment. And do you know what kind of efforts we're doing with the foreman and OAuth at the moment? Uh, not offhand. Yeah, I, I, I can't answer the question definitively, but do we definitely, it's on our, it's, 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 on, it's in the bucket of stuff we know we have to address. Um, in the meantime, uh, just please uh, make sure all your passwords are password and uh, <laughs> pass it in clear. Or Red Hat. We have some Red do. Hat. We, oh, yeah, we yeah. like Red Hat. Yeah. Right, so, so we're looking at ways that we can, the, the push versus pull uh, uh, association between, you know, whether you're pushing to a client or pulling from a client. Um, we're looking at ways to, to, to improve, giving you options surrounding that. Right now it's SSH and that's, that's what it is. I don't know that we have any. Uh, when, I, when I've heard prioritization of what the next provider is, I've heard a message queue base one is the next one. Yeah. So but, it's not been prioritized for 6.3. But that's what I've heard would be the next priority before Ansible Tower or M Collective. But it is relatively trivial to uh, build a heartbeat of check-in from the client to, to, to say, do I have something available? So, um, yeah, I mean, that, we're def we know that's a, a, an issue with SSH, and we are definitely looking into to, to how to solve that. So the, the question was around capsule visibility and how do I understand if my capsule is completely synced. So the screen that we glossed over at the end when I went to the infrastructure and capsule screen, that's the goal of that, is to let you understand what content has been pushed out to your capsule and what the status of those syncs are. Um, if we, 
So 6.2 will have that feature. We can show it to you downstairs in the booth if you'd like to see it. Uh, but that's what the, one of the main goals of that feature. Uh, it's root by default. You can switch it to be an alternative user using sudo or su if you uh, prefer to use an unprivileged user. No, no, no. no. It's what you're what you'll begin to see. I mean, already today, upstream, if you look at Foreman, it's already aware of multiple configuration engines. So there are plugins for Chef upstream. There are plugins for Salt upstream. So what you're going to see is a new plugin. It actually already exists upstream if you go look at it, which is an Ansible plugin. Uh, there will be some work done upstream to make a plugin out of the puppet pieces. And so now you have a pluggable architecture for configuration management. And so then it's up to you which one do you want to install and which one do you want to make use of. So it's the same engine under the covers. It's just making sure, making use of multiple plugins to enable and disable features. Pardon me? If I were a betting man on the Satellite 6 line, since we started Satellite 6 with Puppet, I would expect that both of them would be there by default. Both Going being a puppet and Ansible. Both puppet and Ansible. <coughs> Going forward with future versions, I could see us making one of them, I could see us making Ansible default because that's going to be more consistent with our other management products. But both of them will be available to you going forward. Again, if you've invested in Puppet, your investment's safe. In, in, the, in the end, we are now an Ansible company, right? right. Uh, but that being said, we are not going to leave our Puppet customers behind. Um, uh, but our focus definitely go, we, we start slowly uh, driving folks to, as a recommended platform uh, to be Ansible. Yes, sir. Okay. okay. You can route through the capsule and the server. Yeah. So you should be able to proxy your communication through that route all the way up. So I don't think it completely doubles it, but it's still. It requires no new, the only new firewall rule will require is require port 443 connections of telemetry. Okay. I'm going outbound. All the internal communication traverses the capsule, which are all ports that are already open anyway, because those are ports we use for subscription management data as well. So okay. So it would be the satellite Yeah, you're. you're Right. right. Insights will be passing through the satellite in, yeah. in that regard. And then speaking of ports, we, we are always seeking ways to, to kind, of, kind of control port, port sprawl, and uh, we do recognize it as a, a lingering annoyance um, uh, with, with our customers. And, and, and you, know, you never want to open, have to go to the network guys and say, oh, I need to open another port. Um, so that is certainly something we're looking for in the future, how we can, how we can reduce that. Uh, that's I mean, one it's possible an idea. option. It's an idea, right. and uh, and we're investigating as a po potential uh, route to solve that problem. Yep. Yeah. Time for one more question. We'll yeah, one, one more, more question. And then we'll kick you out for lunch. Okay. Nobody wants then to Then we'll kick you out for lunch. <laughs> thanks thank for coming, y'all. Hey, thanks, everybody. <laughs>